I'm going to ask JPA analyst Patricia Yosa to introduce our last speaker of the day. It is a tremendous pleasure for me to introduce the last um, link of this circumambulation of displacement that um, we have shared today. And um, those of you who are members of the Jungian Psychoanalytic Association community, um, for you, she needs no introduction. Um, Dr. Leslie Noyes, who is a beloved professor, supervisor, and analyst, as well as the Dean of Candidates of the JPA. Um, Leslie has been a Jungian analyst for um, quite a few years, but she's also been a therapist and a Gestalt therapist for over 25 years. And um, she has a previous incarnation as an artist, and she taught pottery down the block at the Greenwich, um, at Greenwich House for over 20 years. And before that, she studied um, pottery and African dyeing techniques uh, at the MFA in Boston. So she has um, a rich background in the arts and in psychology. Um, she presently also teaches at the Zen Center for Contemplative Care. She has uh, her MDiv from Union. Yeah, the Union, the Union crowd. And um, yeah, she is going to take us into um, the realm of um, the psychological subject. And um, I have spoken with her over the last year as she's incubated this. And I think there's a great pleasure ahead for all of us to see how she has sat with this um, material over, um, over the last months. So, Leslie Noyes. Good afternoon, and thank you. Thank you to the JPA and to the committee members who gave me this opportunity, and to the New School, which less than 100 years ago welcomed refugees from the war. I'll talk today about the psychological subject and displacement. How is the subject displaced? What are clinical and collective images of this displacement? And how can Jung's work guide the subject's process? I want to start with a story. <clears throat> when I was a young girl, say five, six years old, and I would get excited, my father would look over the edge of his newspaper and say, who do you think you are, the center of the universe? A no-nonsense man of science, of course his question was not a question. The sarcasm and the finality of it stung deep and hard, paralyzing me on the spot. Suddenly, into my reverie, there arrived a single light bulb of the interrogator swinging into view, blinding me as I struggled through the glare to see who it was who was questioning me, accusing me of what I did not know. Who did I think I was? Honestly, I had no idea. I had hoped to live into that question and find out. But now, in the place of that, there arrived an indisputable fact, as hard as science. I concluded, without realizing it, that the longing to discover myself was wrong. 
my natural excitement became fused in a lightning fast and increasingly permanent encoding in which infinite possibility and wonder was superseded by the larger and apparently more important truth of impossibility. And what was wrong with me that I elicited this from someone so close, so big, so mine? I take the chance to speak personally because I know as an analyst, as many analysts do, that this everyday quiet trauma endured privately is not mine alone. Even with the best personal father, there is a kind of collective father thinking, and it is something that has entered and colonized each of us and our patients. It shapes how we engage our reality and how we frame and investigate our understanding of being a person and being with each other. In short, this is a collective phenomenon which feels profoundly personal, and it is because it resides at the center of our personhood. Mark Epstein, the New York City-based psychiatrist who brings a Buddhist perspective to his work, told the New York Times in an interview that psychotherapy can be boiled down to four words. I am the problem. In his latest book, Meaning and Melancholia, Life in the Age of Bewilderment, the London-based psychoanalyst Christopher Bolas coins a term for his clinical encounter with this phenomenon. He calls this subjecticide. Bolus outlines historically the loss of interiority, wherein the subject finds and creates meaning, and I would add true identity. This loss of the inner life was replaced by material focus and gain. For Bolus, Germany in pre-war Europe was the country that emphasized the inner life of the individual. Thus, when Germany's focus shifted from the individual's inner life to material gain, so did history. From my own clinical experience, I agree with Epstein and with Bolas, and I want to add some other ways to look at the displacement of the subject. Foucault writes that in thought and political action, we have still not cut off the head of the king. Our identity, our capacity for meaning making, our making sense of our lives, and our claiming sanity have everything to do with this king and our beheading of him. One of Jung's signature contributions to psychology was his cross-cultural investigation into an understanding of mythology and religion. Jung separated from Freud by understanding mythological narratives as figurative represent representations of unconscious processes in the individual. Freud condemned religion as a longing for the oceanic feeling. Jung took a deep interest in religious narratives as representations of human experience. These are very different notions of the unconscious. In looking more closely at some of our collectively held narratives, and this is a confession, I re-watched Mel Gibson's Passion. And it hit me this time with the famous story of Jesus being accused of blasphemy by the temple authorities that there is something about being accused that is compelling and universal. It's archetypal. 
We come to know ourselves through others, of course. We live in relationship, and this is both personal and collective. In our personal history, there are figures that become internalized, but I'd like to look today at that phenomenon as it relates to our collective. I'd like to map out some of what is in our collective that is unconscious. Bessel van der Kolk, author of the best-selling The Body Keeps the Score, said something at this conference two years ago that has influenced my thinking greatly. He said, mythology is the telling of soldiers surviving war. Every person sitting in front of us has survived a war. Mostly we think of this as surviving a family of origin, and that's true, but the individual is a battleground whose symptoms image and express the trauma of our collective. Individuals we see as analysts are shell-shocked by our culture. There are many ways to describe our collective, but I'll focus on the collective psychology as it relates to personhood or to the subject. I was struck when I read George Feuerstein, the beloved um, scholar of yoga who recently died. He has written a lot of books, but the one that I am taking this from is called Deeper Dimensions of Yoga, about the psychology of yoga. Yoga off the mat, as it's called. Yoga came broadly to the United States about 100 years ago in the 1920s. After languishing for decades as a quirky phenomenon, it hit the mainstream, and when it did, Feuerstein writes, this long-standing discipline about the inner journey and its outline for transcending the ego mutated in America. Yoga was reduced to fitness, more specifically, stretching, and yet more specifically, stretching of the hamstrings. <laughs> Eugene Taylor, at JPA's Americanization of Jung conference several years ago, described our collective as white bread, white sugar, and white people. Bolus's notion of subjecticide applies to our collective, where the fundamental focus is the material and its gain. Our culture's lack functions as an accusation as it asks each of us to wage a war against our needs. This is a war that not only is against our instincts and our nature, but it is against our unique personality and personhood, which longs for and presses for liberation. We are meaning-making beings whose being is constituted by meaning-making. For Jung, this individuation process is our instinctive nature an irrepressible striving for the truth of oneself, the time one has, and the inevitable questions that come with knowing that one is mortal. Each individual we sit with has internalized a kind of collective moral defense. Looking for more than surface and not finding it, the lack is reversed and turned against themselves. I am the problem. The work of analysis includes making this conscious, sifting, sifting through what the person has internalized, much of which is not true, metabolizing it and relating to it. There are two dilemmas for the subject as I see it. The first is that the other in our collective is often the one who doesn't know who I am. Some of this has to do with our specific collective and its lack, but there is a psychological truth to this. Who we are to others will never hold the truth of who we are. 
Thus, on an interpersonal level, the subject is often caught in opposition. I am not who you say I am. Likewise, there is an inner other who is often against the subject, enforcing dominant collective values of surface only. But secondly, no amount of mirroring can fully mirror an individual to him or herself, because the nature of being an individual is that that individual is unique. And in order for that uniqueness to be fully engaged, which is what individuation requires, the individual must go it on their own. No other can travel this with them because that is the nature of being a one. This one and no other one. This is why Joseph Campbell can say that to find the Holy Grail, you must go into the forest alone and you must go where no one else has gone. This is the truth of being a one and it is the truth of being the only one one is and can be. With no guides in our culture, the subject feels, what's wrong with me that I'm not able to find what I long for? Why can't I be happy with what others are content with? And concludes, I'm the problem. Secondly, the person in their individuation process who leaves the crowd and its surface norms confronts accusatory threshold phenomenon as they seek themselves in their process. Who do you think you are is a refrain found throughout the analytic process. History is written by winners in order to maintain their power. Power to promote and secure their worldview with their dominance. And the Bible is no different. Prior to the narrative of Jesus being accused is our very familiar creation story, the story of the garden and our displacement from it. In our creation story, there are many, many trees in the garden in the east. At the center of the garden are two trees, just two trees that are named, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The couple is allowed to eat of every tree except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the opposites. When they do, they fall from the garden of unity into time and they are aware of their mortality. Scholars tell us that this creation text is written to demonstrate an historical victory of the northern peoples whose God is a separate father sky god. This text is a representation of an historical victory over an earlier, more imminent feminine God image. Indeed, a God image out of whose body we emanate. All is imaged as her, as a one. All that is, is in her, as her, the great mother. Our creation story represents this earlier feminine mythology of the Great Mother as the tree of life. With this tree, all is a one. In earlier mythology, because we eat, we rupture or violate the oneness of that one. There is guilt and terror about this fact. To repair the, one of the oneness of the one, the one's oneness, rituals of renewal take place in caves, which are her womb. All that is, dies, and is reborn in or as this she. There is unity in totality. Our familiar garden story is a representation of a battle between these two perspectives, not simply historically, but psychologically. Each God image corresponds to a psychological stance. One mind is the mind that separates, I'm gonna call it the ego. The other mind is the mind that can hold opposites in a consciousness that transcends them, the self. To eat 
of the knowledge of good and evil is to overcome the opposites in a consciousness of non-duality, non-displacement, all as a one. Our creation myth represents that this is no longer where consciousness is collectively. Our story represents the conquering of the dividing God image over the all as one God image. The all as one God image is the great mother, the tree of life, the world tree, the self. This consciousness is now taboo. This is the same taboo of the temple authorities that Jesus confronts. Both our creation narrative and the narrative of Jesus' being accused outline the victory of the king's head, a kind of thinking that divides and separates, it dissociates, it displaces, it eventually creates hierarchy. This thinking is built on the prohibition against unity. This taboo organizes our mainstream epistemology and thought. With the reign of this king, we are displaced from our given unity and divided from ourselves by our dissociative processes. Jungian theory and practice is meant to behead that king and his taboo. In a consciousness of non-duality, of unity, opposites are distinct, but they are not oppositional. Good, evil, life, death, male, female, you, me, are distinct, but they do not oppose one another. All is held in a unitive vision in which opposites are co-created at once via their relationship to one another. Now, unitive consciousness, imaged as the great mother, can be sentimentalized as wanting to stay unconscious, or sometimes it's literalized as a time gone by of the matriarchy. Neither is true. Both thoughts represent a reductive bias of king thinking. Leaving binary ego consciousness is taboo. It's taboo to be conscious of the opposites and transcend them. It is taboo to be undivided and non-dissociated. Forbidden now, this is blasphemy. Sometimes overcoming the opposites that organize Western mainstream thinking means participating in a consciousness that is a mystical vision of all as one. But, this consciousness is also a model of being a one, of being an individual who is undivided. And now it's wrong, taboo. This is our war with the other out there, and it is a war with the other within ourselves. Longing for unity, we are accused. Who do you think you are overcoming the opposites? Our creation story illustrates what scholars call the Great Reversal, a collective movement around 3200 BCE in which there is a paradigm shift of world and self view from a long-standing tens of thousands of year old vision of all as one. This unitive consciousness is figured as a God image that is female, and this is displaced by a new structure of consciousness based on separation and division imaged as a male figure. Now, death is an enemy, no longer understood as part of a renewal cycle. Terror is the norm of it, and what was once the permanent possibility of renewal is displaced by the eternal impossibility of war with its scarcity, threat, and defenses. War is the new permanent event and narrative. Agency is mobilized against unity, either in the person's psychology or in personal relations. Impossibility has replaced possibility. There are always at least two histories. In the clinical event, there is the ego's narrative of a person's life and the story the self seeks to tell. 
Collective history is also full of different narratives. The winner's narrative is the story of the one who prevails over others. And then there is the shadow, the story of the othered. Jung saw this interplay and noted how our collective's imbalance resides within the individual. For Jung, the mind that must prevail in the first half of life is the mind that divides, dominates, displaces, and dissociates. This mind lives in power dynamics, defensively divides us from others, and lives in categories of the opposites, right, wrong, good, bad, me, you, sane, mad. But since individuation presses for unity, meaning, and fulfillment, the mind of transcending these opposites must be engaged. As analysts, we know that nothing is ever lost. It has only gone underground, been exiled, or displaced, or dissociated. As analysts, we learn to listen to the ego's history and narrative, but we are also listening for the shadow or exiled history, what Foucault calls disqualified knowledge, knowledge that is unconscious, buried, or dissociated. Somewhere, the patient knows what has happened, and like revolutions within colonized countries, symptoms express the knowledge that the inner ruling monarch has disqualified. Like colonized countries, resistances, uprisings, revolts, and revolutions are all against this monarch's head and its regime. This is the self's expression. When I read Epstein's summary of psychotherapy, I am the problem, I thought, wow, this is so true. And it reminded me of Van der Kolk's quote, each of us has a war that we must work through. But while the war is unconsciously internalized in everyone, different people do different things with it. And I get it that it's a spectrum, but I, 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 just go with me, I think you'll get it. Some people internalize the war and are filled with self-hatred. Other people project their self-hatred outward in an attempt to get rid of it. People in the family or the collective who are not wrestling with themselves, not becoming conscious, do not say, I am the problem. They have four other words, you are the problem. Parents can do this to children and collectives can do it to people who are vulnerable. The powerful in our collective are basically psychologically lazy, with little, if any, capacity to go inward and confront themselves. Thus, they live with ghosts. Their unmet hunger and unmetabolized lack of finding is projected and displaced onto others. Blame, scapegoating, accusation. Foucault calls this our punitive society. Our institutions of civilization are the way that the permanent division and dissociation of the religious narrative get delivered, implemented, and maintained. Foucault calls these sites of regulation. These are the family, the church, our education system, the judicial and prison systems, our medical system, including psychology and its scientism. I would add the media, especially social media. And while Foucault talks of the family, I would suggest that motherhood is the most regulated site of all. These sites monitor, surveil, and train the individual as to what is collectively upheld about personhood, meaning, and identity. Our institutions embody and deliver our mythology of division and taboo against unity and meaning making. They are built on egoic defenses of dissociation, displacement, projection, the gaze. 
These sites keep us in performative identities and deliver messages of comparison. They socialize us for limit and scarcity. They keep us defined interpersonally in a war of opposing siblings, parents, classes, races, genders. Who we are is who we are, who the other in power says we are. The external authority defines us, and the best a person can do is push against this authority in opposition. The subject, looking for more or to be reflected or understood in his or her struggle, instead experiences being judged, monitored, known but unable to know the knower, Accused, overpowered, maligned, corrected, commodified for talent or not, deemed useful or not. Dreams, image, security cameras in hotel rooms, lost wallets and IDs, no direction, endless tasks, mirrors with no reflection. Something is watching, always watching. Nothing real or true or actually meaningful. Westworld. Our surface culture is like an enormous narcissistic disorder and web of inadequacy with hungry ghost people unhappy, discontent, and unfulfilled, blaming and accusing one another for their unhappiness. Sites of regulation, our culture's way of delivering notions of what matters, have failed people, leaving them bereft and living without guidance, reflection, or meaning. Some people take this on, and others simply pass it on to others. The interesting thing is that all our sites of regulation took as their model the religious monastery. And the monastery was built on the great reversal of dissociation. This religious authority perpetuated ego-hijacked theology through strict regimen, discipline over one's body, precise timing of rituals, strict notion of what is acceptable and what is shadow. The monastery model became the vehicle for all other institutions to be sites of regulation, whereby the great reversal became our norm with its internalized war against oneself. Society was regulated with this ego co-opted God image of a withholding and rejecting object, which is promoted by collective sites of regulation and internalized in the individual. Western European mainstream religion is the primary vehicle for delivering this perspective, which is the monarchs and the egos. This is so ubiquitous that we barely see it. Actually, we don't see it. We feel it. We know it without thinking it. It is an unthought known, our collective unconscious. The pinnacle of this perspective is the prison. In the prison, there is a compulsory visibility. Inspection functions ceaselessly. The gaze is alert everywhere. It is the fact of constantly being seen, of being able always to be seen, that maintains the disciplined individual in his subjection. The stated goal of the prison is for surveillance and display to be fully and completely internalized in the prisoner. Within the person, this accusation functions to not see the subject. The accuser's role is to disallow understanding with the accused rendered a defendant only. That is the accuser's purpose. The person seeking him or herself acquires an identity of criminality and non-personhood. Accusation is the vehicle that renders the person not legitimate to himself or to others, reduced in a fixated defense against accusation. 
by the time a person sits with us in analysis, the entire operation is internalized. Patients police themselves and don't know how to stop. The accusation is permanent. The sense of needing correction is complete. The security camera, the prison guard, the sense of being a problem or being sick and never being able to find the sickness, the comparative grid of social relations, the crappy sense of worth, all these image that the great reversal has been internalized. I am the problem, bewilderment subject aside. For most of our patients, they come to us because they can no longer perform some assigned role or identity. The king's head has left them bewildered as they perform subjecticide without awareness. You can see this in dreams. Subjecticide is imaged as never getting out, never getting in, always being watched, never having power, others having all the power, never feeling good, clean, whole, real, unique, alive. Always watched, but never able to know the knower always compared with others and coming up short, never being in the time that is theirs as who they are, not being able to drop down and find a privacy beyond this gaze. Each time the person attempts to enter time and be visible or experience being real, they experience so themselves as wrong for being who they are. Or if love arrives, they have no idea who is loved. Imprisoned in a psychology of accusation becomes an identity of badness, or worse, non-personhood, or non-being, with the bewilderment and terror that accompanies it. You can listen in collective history for images that we see clinically. The accused, imprisoned, the one who soldiers on without meaning, the frenzied, the misunderstood, the useless, the rejected, the delinquent, the criminal, the outcast, the one who cannot perform an identity for others but can't stop trying. These are images of the subject. Mainstream history is written by the powerful to keep their story in place, what they call progress. But there is a history in the shadows of another lineage. History can also be a telling of upheavals and paradigm shifts. I'm going to tell you another story. I came to New York City to attend Union Theological Seminary in 1981. I don't know who clapped, but... Okay. All right. Yeah, there's a few. Okay. I was 23 years old. At the same time I entered Jungian analysis, walking in the halls at Union then were Cornell West, James Cohn, James Forbes, Janet Walton, James Washington, my teachers, my mentors. This place had importance. You could just feel it in the architecture, in the commitment of the professors, in the students, in the courses, in the daily worship. It was here that I saw firsthand an upheaval of history that is still going on today. Sitting in class called Liberation Theology with James Cohn, who died last year, I learned that there are at least two God images. He said there were two. Like Eugene Taylor and Jung, James Cohn saw in history a tension between the God image of the powerful and status quo and the God image of those who live in the shadows. Liberation theology claimed God for the oppressed. God was not on the side of the powerful, but rather in the community of the oppressed, what today might be called othered. God was imaged as vulnerable, encountered in and through our vulnerability. God was known through the human experience of suffering. God, for Cone, was in our struggle to be free. Resting ego hijacked theology from the powerful was a mighty thing to see. Reclaiming authority as founded on our humanity was a reversal of mainstream religion's great reversal. 
our experience in our lives mattered. It is through our vulnerability, it is through our inability, indeed our failure to live divided and militaristically against ourselves and others that we find the real North Star which orients us and guides our process. In Cohn's class, I learned that the powerful do not know the living God, their God is an image of their status quo power, and they use that God image to keep their power. The history of the mainstream church is the history of the powerful controlling others through an ideology camouflaged as theology. It is an ideology of the ego with its tools of division, dissociation, and displacement. In America, this religion was used to keep slaves obedient and passive. This religion was and still is used to keep women from thinking for themselves about their bodies, their reproductive rights, and their desires. This religion is used to frighten children into obedience. It is used to keep followers dead while alive, believing that eternal life is a time-bound notion. This religion keeps us in an abdication of our stewardship for this beautiful planet. Cohn's gospel of liberation theology was that human suffering was a sacred call of the living God for those who suffer to claim themselves now. Needless to say, I was on fire with this newly discovered thinking of God as related to and caring about human experience and liberation. The two were not separate, tree of life. I was on fire with this new possibility, so of course I talked in my Jungian analysis about what was awakening in me. I told my analyst, that's what I'm after. I want my own, I am. I want to come to myself, be for myself, as myself, in myself. I want self-determination. And I will never know what was going on for that analyst who, without skipping a beat, said with all the solemnity of a Jungian, oh, Leslie, this is not for you. Because you are female, you are for others. Yep. <laughs> Here I stand. <laughs> the truth is, this analyst didn't tell me anything that I hadn't already unconsciously believed and tried to make work. But I was looking for something different from our collective, and I got the same. The analytic space was not yet able then to help reverse the great reversal. But he was the authority in the situation. He was the one who knew. I didn't see that I had done that. I'd given him authority, and it is humbling to admit that it took about a year to extricate myself. Looking for liberation, looking for a different identity, I learned painfully that analysis can be as much a site of regulation as religion. Behind the psychoanalyst office is some history whose images can guide our work. Psychoanalysis begins formally with Charcot working at the Salpietre in Paris with hypnosis. These early clinicians are looking to understand a new class of diseases called neurasthenia or neurosis. Freud, Jung, Ferenczi, and William James are all attending Charcot's lectures to learn hypnosis as a technique to access what they called the pathogenic secret, trauma, displacement of the subject. Charcot's hospital, like most at the time, was established not only to cure physical diseases, Hospitals, called Lazar houses for Lazarus raised from the dead, 
were holding containers for the frenzied, the mad, and the petty criminal. Side by side with the physically sick were the sick in mind. Rather than placing these people on the ship of fools, often to America, they were displayed so as to communicate to others just what non-performance looks like. Spectacle, with its tools of shame and humiliation, is the powerful instrument of instruction and coercion to those whom they believe must be educated. Punishment is never for the crime, but it's a warning to the rest of us. Lynchings, Senate hearings, and chants of lock her up continue this tradition. The deviant, the delinquent, the mad and frenzied were displayed often in center city so that the image of humiliation fused in the imagination of spectators. Excuse me. The spectacle of the non-performative was on display for others to see. This is what deviation from the great reversal looks like. Spectacle is the delivery vehicle for sites of regulation. Terror and shame are the internalization of spectacle. When Charcot oversees the Salpietre at the center of Paris, he inherits this lineage of surveillance and correction from the monastery and from the prison. He inherits the lineage of a bifurcation between knower and known. He inherits and unconsciously carries the premise of dissociation. And what is interesting is that at this particular hospital, where Charcot brought the technique of hypnosis into the field of science, thus birthing psychoanalysis, there were housed anywhere from two to 4,000 patients, all of whom were women. What lies behind this strange phenomenon is that in the 1800s, there develops more formally in the military the notion of the making of a soldier modeled after the making of a priest. There is precise instruction for posture, thought, comportment, and habits. At the same time, there arises an understanding of disease as erupting in a person because they are not solid enough. Just as an individual can be made and molded into something they are not, there arises a thinking that a lack of this discipline and the capacity to perform this identity becomes associated with a weakness and a openness that is decidedly feminine. Performing muscle, militaristic discipline against oneself, the ego's delivery of the great reversal, is what is valued. Being prepared for the eternal war is to be knowledgeable. Not performing this war against oneself becomes the explanation for disease. We are one step away from vulnerability, porosity, and lack of vigilance as disease. We are one step away from non-defensiveness as disease. We are also one step away from disease not being a disease assigned to the feminine in everyone, but assigned to the female. Jungian theory upholds the teleology of the symptom. Jung's notion of the unconscious is twofold. Not only are symptoms a result of the past, but they are pulling the person forward to a different perspective, identity, and horizon. Symptoms pull the person to individuate, to be undivided, and to individuate is to behead the king. Rebirth is the event that mythology always figures, and it is a transformation of consciousness from the warring mind of the embattled survivor to a mind which includes all in a non-binary and non-negating capacity. Individuation is the process of engaging that unity in a new consciousness. 
Ricoeur writes in Figuring the Sacred that religious narrative is built on this double event of the unconscious. This reflective process of looking back to look forward is the mind of the cave, seeking to overcome dissociation and gain unity, this time in a consciousness that can hold these opposites. Patients look back at the war they've endured and perpetuated and welcome with new understanding the one who has survived. Through this capacity, the person gains agency toward their past, but also in general, and now they are choosing to relate to what is in them. Once they were dissociated, their reflective capacity now builds cohesion. The binary of self-hatred and self-love is replaced by a rhythm between the two. This rhythm is created by a mourning process which holds these opposites in a new understanding in which the person can see that self-hatred is actually what brought forth self-love. The mind that fractures experience begins to coalesce around the capacity to reflect and hold these opposites in a new attitude of acceptance, not of what happened, but that it happened. And the subject can mourn. For recur, the subject moves from one logic to another. Being pathologized creates what Ricoeur calls a summoned subject. The responding self is the one who responds to a call from within. Who has been disqualified is who is called from pathologized exile to the center. As kingship of the other and the ego is decentered, the subject begins to claim their own validity by speaking what is within them. Here, ego and external authority still reign in the form of threat or retaliation. Patients are terrified. I'll be punished. I'll get sick. I'll be shot at dawn. I'll be homeless or shunned, cast out. Prison guards are at every turn demanding, who do you think you are? There is an intense threat to speaking one's truth as they fear the entire organizing structure will collapse if they don't obey. They fear they will not exist or matter if they leave this external frame of reference also internal. With an enormous amount of suffering and returning again and again to what has been, the person drops more and more into their truth and sacrifices any notion of being known by sites of regulation, the ego or the monarchy. There comes a moment in every treatment where the narcissistic effort to get the accusatory other to be different is sacrificed as self-hating. Patients begin to see that it is not their fault that the other has more power, but now it is their responsibility. Here, I find Jung's notion of the prospective piece of repetition compulsion. Patients can see that being caught in a complex or being drawn to a place of deprivation again and again is actually offering to them an opportunity to gather themselves to themselves, this time for themselves. And there is new experience and understanding. Looking back, they see differently what first appeared in the trauma event. Feeling accused, the subject can now see that someone, another one, registered this way of being known as wrong. And their symptoms know this. The initial event or situation of trauma holds a negative of truth. Like Andre Green's work of the negative, the negative here is delivered via accusation. And the subject, deep in their being, is bewildered. But it is the bewildered one who knows. 
The who who is bewildered is the one who knows that they can be different. In a way of paradox, self-hatred brings forth self-love. Bewilderment holds the possibility of something new. It holds the possibility to think consciously what has been known, quote unquote, unconsciously as symptom only. I am not who they say I am. I must find who I am. This instinctual drive turns into, I am not who I thought I was. Who I am is not who has been known, how I've known myself, or who can ever be known fully. There is a threshold in clinical work where the person realizes that the way they've been known does not know them at all. At the same time, they realize that they also don't know who they are. To my mind, this is imaged as the cave's emptiness. Like the empty tomb after the cross of opposites, this is an image not of lack, but of potential. This emptiness is not the lack of knowing our collective says it is. Rather, it is the necessary opening in oneself to what is unknown, which can include one's goodness. The other who is bound to blame and accusation will never be changed by our efforts. There is a confrontation here with what has been abdicated. If the powerful project onto the vulnerable, the vulnerable have projected as well. The powerful are not going to withdraw their projections, but the vulnerable can. The other is not going to be different. The only one who can be different is me. Here there is another rhythm, as there is loss and sacrifice of this fool's errand in which the other has the authority to determine one's worth, there is at the same time a claiming of authority they once thought was only outside of them. In this rhythm of reckoning and rene renewal, my work is mine, which no one can give to or take from me, and it is who I claim to be. I make myself in my own reflective capacity. This occurs in the interior cave where there is a new capacity of encounter and discovery. Here, in this darkness, there is no other. Here, there is primary guilt for having needs and for being a separate one. Responsibility for the one one is can be confronted and metabolized, creating a renewal of one's identity as a timeless one. This is entering emptiness with non-bias. Emptiness not as a lack as our collective unconscious would assign to it, but as potential for infinite renewal. Here, emptiness is a fullness that includes all. Here, emptiness is possibility, not disease. Those to whom wrong identity has been assigned and who wrestle against this war and have failed at its premise are the only ones who are inaugurated to the possibility of this different liberating logic. This is where failure is success. This is where the negative gives birth to an all. The one in each of us who has been accused is the one who is initiated to possibility. This is logic of radical possibility out of impossibility. This is overcoming the opposites in unitive logic framed by mourning, sacrifice, and loss. The subject who is condemned and exiled within their own psyche and body is the only one who can create freedom. The subject now claims a premise of identity wrought through their own reflective process in their being, through their suffering, not in spite of it. This is mourning and melancholia wrought in cave encounter in the privacy of the subject. There are always at least two histories. The ego tells one and the self tells another. The ego story is an increasingly defensive vigilance against oneself and others. The ego story is a permanent and ever-increasing war and failure. 
It is the narrative of impossibility. The self tells the story that these things happen to all of us and there is no shame in coming undone. Coming undone by forces beyond us is human, not female. Coming undone by forces beyond us is what brings us to an infinitely renewing possibility. Accepting our innate vulnerability brings us there as well. Coming undone inaugurates us to claiming ourselves not in opposition, but in autonomy and responsibility. We inherit a terrible collective bias and abhorrence against this feminine cave capacity to gather up into ourselves all that has been displaced. But this is the process which centers the subject's liberation, what Jung named the self. Like a colonized country seeking sovereignty, patient's symptoms are the uprisings and rebellion against a regime that is wrong. From the shadow of their history springs possibility in what has been maligned, frenzied, imprisoned, and accused. In the clinical hour, we sit at the interface between the past and the war the person has survived and perpetuated, and we look forward to the overcoming of that war as their symptoms pull them to a new identity. We enter the cave and a consciousness which can hold both accuser and savior as double aspects of narcissistic injury. We hold the past as the future, the other as oneself, and the shadow as gold. Here, a new identity is wrought, an identity claimed, not given. This identity transcends those opposites by holding them at once. And here is where the capacity to mourn offers a new way. For Ricoeur, with this, the subject, these are his words, is a scent mandated, commissioned, and commanded subject. Her identity is not what she comes from, nor how others, even those internalized now, have known her. Who she is is not even who is known, either through family, education, science, or any other of our sites of regulation. The subject's identity is beyond his or her condition or effort to perform an, an assigned identity. From this capacity comes the testimony of the one who seeks and finds, the one who speaks the truth of his or her experience, and it is this speaking which replaces the centrality of accusation. We produce in our reflection a new meaning, not meaning that has always been there, but meaning created in reflection in the person who was once disqualified. This is where the truth of I am this one and no other one is rendered. I want to add something here specific to Jungian theory. Throughout Jung's writing, Jung spoke of how the hero myth in the West had overshadowed all other motifs. If mythology is the story of soldiers returning from war, there comes a time when the war is meant to be over. And this means a different narrative that includes what our collective has left out. To my mind, this different narrative is imaged in the Pieta, who receives the one who has survived the war. She images a different perspective after the immobilization of accuser and accused. This gaze, her gaze, from a one who is also maligned, offers a different radical logic beyond the hero myth. Her gaze is timeless because it includes looking back to look forward. She can embrace him with understanding because she herself has come undone as well. This is a figuring of an inner human event. And this is an image of analytic reverie. We can see this different narrative in the shadows of the person and in the shadows of history. This other view has been there all along. 
We see her in the renewal processes of the cave, in the Pieta's compassionate gaze toward the hero after the battle of the opposites. We see her in the Mater Dolorosa, whose shameless sorrow images her renunciation. We see her in the gaze of nudes without pretense throughout the ages. And we can see her in the courage of patients whose symptoms are transformed through their own reflection. This possibility was imaged in the cave, not in the splitting and defensive hope of the hero's rescue from accusation. We do this within ourselves as we transcend that binary and surrender enough to who we actually are and mourn time lost in those abdicating efforts. We cannot save anyone, nor can anyone save us. That notion is contaminated with narcissism. Through entering the cave of responsibility, we come to ourselves. We curtail the war of interpersonal narcissism as well as the warring self-hatred within. Analysis is a ritual of repair for one's lost oneness and it is a gathering up into consciousness what one has done to oneself and others in order to survive. We look back to move forward to a different horizon. Our analytic reverie links to the lineage of the cave. If one confronts the mind of colonization and its narcissism, it is metabolized and mourned. As analysts, we know this radical possibility because we've traversed this arc as well. What my father and my first analyst gave to me came in the negative. Their wrong views lit a fire in me to claim an identity which transcends the imprisoning and colonizing logic of our collective. Each of us who carries our, sh our collectives, you are the problem, carries the same possibility. I want to leave you with one last biblical reference. Joseph Campbell says that the feminine is found hiding throughout the Bible. Ezekiel's encounter with God is part of the hidden, hidden feminine lineage lost to the mainstream. Remember, Ezekiel struggled with a stiff-necked people. When Ezekiel is called to his own I am, God holds a scroll out with words written on its front and back. On it were written words of lamentation, mourning, and woe. God tells Ezekiel to eat the scroll, which Ezekiel obeys. And Ezekiel proclaims, it was in my mouth as sweet as honey. When we drop the war of opposites, we gather to ourselves our history and metabolize our guilt for what we have done to ourselves to survive, for what we allowed, for what we falsely believed, for what we gave away without regard. We come to a new identity and it is indeed not what we expected. Not victims, but not winners. We leave the logic of those ego defenses of opposites. We stand on new ground. Ezekiel continues the lineage of cave unity and responsibility for one's identity. Eat the shadow. Eat your guilt for what you have done to yourself and to others to survive. This is a mighty process of the cave and of analysis, but it is the way to claim an identity that is not based on our collective's warring and egoic logic and lack. It is the way of the self with its own logic of renewal and possibility. It is each individual's being called to I am and standing on ground made holy by struggle. Thank you.